Alfredo Prito was born on November 18, 1965 in San Martin, El Salvador to parents Arnaldo and Teodoro Prito. Prito was one of six children and spent his childhood and adolescence in poverty. Arnaldo Prito proved to be a violent person who would beat Teodora, forcing her to leave El Salvador in 1975 and immigrate to the United States. During the Salvadoran Civil War, Alfredo witnessed many people being killed, including his grandfather who died right in front of him, unsurprisingly leading Alfredo to be diagnosed with PTSD later on in life. In 1981, Alfredo's mom returned to El Salvador to retrieve her children and bring them back to the United States, settling in Pomona, California. While in Pomona High, Alfredo became addicted to drugs and alcohol. It was also around this time that Alfredo and his brother would meet a girl named Sandra Figuera, whose brother was a member of the street gang 456 Island Peru. As a way to attract Sandra's attention, Alfredo joined the gang under the patronage of her brother. After becoming a member of 456 Island, Alfredo became romantically involved with Sandra and dropped out of high school. The couple would marry shortly after and Sandra would give birth to the couple's first child in 1984. Not surprisingly though, the couple's marriage wouldn't last. In August of 1984, Prito attacked three people on the street. He shot and wounded Elias Vera, Mario Naranjo, and Mercedes Salazar with a pistol from the inside of his car. After his arrest, Prito said the reason for this attack was to seek revenge on Mario Naranjo for having an affair with his wife. Alfredo's wife, Sandra, in turn, claimed that after the wedding and the birth of their daughter, she was subjected to constant sexual abuse and aggression. Alfredo vehemently denied these allegations and actually had relatives testify on his behalf, saying that they had never witnessed Alfredo being aggressive towards his daughter, and further going on to say that he took very good care of her. In late 1984, Alfredo was found guilty of the attacks in Ontario. It is believed that, because the victims were also gang members, the judge showed leniency to him. Petra was given a minor sentence and was released from jail in 1987. After his release, Petro left California and settled in Arlington, Virginia, where his father had settled after emigrating to the United States. Once in Arlington, Alfredo found a job and met another woman who would give birth to his second child, a son. At the end of 1989, Alfredo's father was arrested and jailed for the rape of a woman. After his father's conviction in February of 1990, Alfredo left Virginia and moved back to California. In the early morning hours of September 2, 1990, Alfredo, along with 29-year-old Vincent Lopez and 33-year-old Danny Sorian, robbed a man named Anthony Rangela in Ontario, California. The three men took Anthony hostage and drove him to his house that he shared with his 33-year-old Aunt Emily, his aunt's 17-year-old daughter Lisa, and Lisa's 15-year-old friend Yvette Woodruff. Once there, the three men threatened the girls with the knife while they stole their money and keys. The men then forced the girls into the backseat of the car and drove off. They began driving to the outskirts of the city. It was during this visit that Vincent Lopez began arguing with Alfredo Prito and Danny Sorian. Vincent refused to participate any further and eventually exited the car. After Vincent's departure, the two men ran into another friend of theirs, Ricardo Estrado, while buying gas. Estrado decided to join the men and they continued driving with the three girls still in the back seat. They took the girls to an industrial zone on the eastern outskirts of the city. Once there, they dragged the girls into an abandoned building where they raped each of the girls with a gun. After they were done, Prito shot and killed 15-year-old Yvette Woodruff. Sorian and Estrada stabbed 33-year-old Emily and 17-year-old Lisa multiple times before fleeing the scene. Despite severe injuries and extensive blood loss, Emily and Lisa not only survived the ordeal, but were able to make it to a payphone to call for help. The two women were taken to a hospital while police went to retrieve Yvette's body. A few days later, police would find the car that was abandoned at the crime scene. It didn't take long for the street informants to find out about the crime and leak the information to police. Prito, Sorian, and Estrada were all arrested between September 6th through the 22nd of 1990. Prito himself was arrested on September 6th without incident. While police were searching his apartment, they found the victim's pistol, which was later determined to be the murder weapon. Alfredo Prito was charged with first-degree murder, rape, kidnapping, and robbery. On January 21st, 1992, Prito was found guilty by a jury of all counts and was sentenced to death. Twelve days later, Prito was transferred to San Quentin State Prison, where he would spend the next 14 years awaiting execution on death row. 
In early 2005, the state of California passed a law that forced all convicts in the state to submit their DNA. This law resulted in Prieto's DNA being entered into a national DNA database. In early 2006, while awaiting execution on San Quentin's death row, Prieto's DNA was linked to eight more murders committed between 1988 and 1990. At 3 a.m. on May 11, 1988, 24-year-old Veronica Lynn Jefferson, nicknamed Tina, was found raped and shot at point-blank range behind McKinley Elementary School in Arlington, Virginia. There were no tears or rips in her clothing, which suggested to police that her attacker was not a stranger. The day after Tina's body was found, her red Camaro with personalized license plates, MSBLJ for Miss Veronica Lynn Jefferson, was found at the giant supermarket near Columbia Pike, just two blocks from her apartment. The car was unlocked and the keys were missing. It was later determined that the car had been wiped clean of fingerprints. After examining the inside of the car, police found a time-stamped receipt that she left the supermarket at 9.30 p.m. Her purse was found with all of the money and credit cards inside. A box cutter that is believed to belong to the killer was also found. Police questioned Giant's 186 employees. One employee admitted to seeing her that night and was able to describe Veronica down to her red shoes. Investigators were able to narrow down the employees to six potential suspects. Investigators took blood samples of their six suspects to compare to the body fluids found at the crime scene. The fluids at the crime scene showed a rare blood type that belonged to only 4% of the population. Because none of the six suspects' DNA matched, police were back to square one. Still believing it was someone she knew, her friends and roommates gave police a list of possible suspects, but DNA cleared them all as well. In May 1989, John and Betty Flanagan came forward claiming to have seen Tina that night at the supermarket while standing at the deli counter. He noticed an African-American male arrive and begin flirting with her. Mr. Flanagan did not believe that Tina and the identified male had previously known each other. Mrs. Flanagan stated that while they were both putting groceries in their cars, she saw the man approach Tina again. Mrs. Flanagan stated that based on the body language, she did believe that Tina wanted a way out of the situation, but did not believe that it was serious enough that she needed help. This composite sketch was made of the man that was seen with Tina that night. Veronica Lynn Jefferson, or Tina, was born on November 1, 1964. Originally from Oklahoma, she had recently moved out to the area for a job as a CPA and was also working as a finance officer for the CIA. What a brilliant girl with a beautiful future. 22-year-old Warren Fulton was the captain of the George Washington University baseball team. He had dreams of making it to the majors. His girlfriend, 22-year-old Rachel Raver, had recently graduated from George Washington University and had plans on going on to law school. On December 3rd, 1988, Warren and Rachel met up with friends at a bar in the Washington, D.C. area. At 12.30 a.m., they left the bar, got in Rachel's car, and were never seen alive again. Three days later, on December 6th, Warren and Rachel were found dead in an out-of-the-way wooded area. Rachel had been raped and both victims were shot dead near Hunter Mill Road in Reston, Virginia. It was believed the killer met Warren and Rachel after they walked out of the bar that night, took them by gunpoint, and forced them to drive from D.C. to the suburbs. Once there, Warren was killed first and Rachel tried to escape. Tragically, though, the killer had caught up with her, raped her, and then took her life before fleeing in her car. A single hair found on Rachel's body told police that it was an African-American man that was familiar with the area that had committed these crimes. Rachel's family had become obsessed with solving this case. Her mother, Veronica, would spend all of her free time driving around the D.C. area. Rachel's sister told the Richmond Times in June of 2014, quote, This was my little sister. A day does not go by that I don't think of her. She was very bubbly and very fun. She would light up the whole room. The light went out when Rachel died. It was right before Christmas. This was hell for my late mother, Veronica, who would travel down in between cancer treatments, leaving my sister and I to stay with my elderly father who has dementia, end quote. She went on to say that her mother, who passed in 2012, was a fixture in the courtroom. One year after the murders, Rachel's mom, Veronica, saw a broadcast about 24-year-old Tina Jefferson, who was found dead behind the school. Police didn't believe the cases were linked for several reasons. One, Tina was black and Rachel and Warren were white. Two, 
Tina was alone while Rachel and Warren were together. Finally, police believed that Tina knew her killer while they believed Rachel and Warren's murders were random. They would later find out that they couldn't be more wrong. September 2nd, 1989, 27-year-old Manuel F. Sermino was found shot to death inside of a burning car near Prince William Forest Park. Ballistics would later link this crime to Alfredo Prito. May 5th, 1990, a jogger discovered the bodies of 19-year-old Stacy Segrist and 21-year-old Anthony Giannuzzi. The couple who were in a relationship were last seen on the evening of May 3rd, 1990. Stacy was sexually assaulted and shot once in the side of her head and once in the back of the neck. Anthony had his wrists and feet tied and was shot once in the back of his head and once in the back of his neck. Ballistics would trace these murders back to Alfredo Prito once again. June 2nd, 1990, Lula Farley, age 71, and Herbert Farley, age 65, were abducted in Ontario, California. Lula was found shot to death. Two weeks later, Herbert Farley's body was found, and he was also shot to death. Ballistics once again linked these murders to Prito. December 16th, 2010, Alfredo Prito was convicted of three more of the murders he was linked to. Veronica Tina Jefferson, Rachel A. Raver, and Warren H. Fulton, and received three more death sentences. Fairfax County Circuit Court Judge Randy Bellows told Preto at his sentencing, what you did to those two young people was vile and horrible and beyond the pale. He went on to say that he saw no reason to reduce his sentence to life without parole. As Preto was being led out of the courtroom, victim's mother, Veronica Raver, stood up and said, Hey, Preto. Does your mother know you raped dying dead girls? As her family restrained her, she yelled out, 22 years of this crap. But Preto had no response. Preto was the first person to receive a death sentence in Fairfax County since Mr. Imal Kazi in 1998 for a double murder outside of the CIA headquarters in Langley. Mr. Kazi was executed in 2002. Alfredo Prito was executed on October 1, 2015 by lethal injection at the Greensville Correctional Center in front of his relatives and some of the victim's family members. He spoke his last words right before his execution, saying, quote, I would like to say thanks to all my lawyers, all my supporters, and all my family members. Get this over with, end quote. This was the first and only time he spoke publicly regarding his crimes. October 1, 2015, 49-year-old Alfredo Preto was pronounced dead at 9.17 p.m.